This is CBC Here and Now. Huge flames shooting out of the top of the mill last night in Cornerbrook. The pictures are incredible. I'll tell you what happened. The mill's whistle blew last night in Cornerbrook, warning of a fire. Frustrations over a shutdown emergency room stretch into their fourth month here in St. Albans. The majority of the population here is their seniors, and myself included. And in the wintertime, sometimes that road is impassable. I'm Gare Berry, and I'll bring you that story coming up on Here Now. COVID-19 has sent the aviation industry into a spiral. More job losses here at the St. John's International Airport Authority. We'll speak with the CEO. That's coming up. Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. Our top story tonight, a burst of flames that could have been much worse. The pulp and paper mill in Cornerbrook caught fire late last night. Here and Now's Colleen Connors now with what happened. Today, the Cornerbrook pulp and paper mill looks quite normal. It seems as though things are in full operation, but it was a very different scene at 1130 here last night. <laughs> That mill whistle sounded almost a dozen times, signaling the mill's own fire brigade. According to Cornerbrook's deputy fire chief, equipment, possibly a fan, in paper machine number two caught fire. Staff who were working in the mill started pouring water on the flames. Then the mill's own firefighters started in. Firefighters in Cornerbrook could see the blaze from the fire station. They rushed down to help. The big thing was, it looked terrible. Uh, fire in the night does that. Uh, even myself, when I, I left home and when I got inside of the mill, I said, you know, it's going to be a long night. Uh, met up with Chief Vaders at the mill site at the gate. Uh, made a good plan of attack. He knows that mill like the back of his hand. Uh, shared some information. Crews made it together and started advancing into the fire area. The mill crews were already fighting the fire at the time. And I'd say the whole situation was under control in 20 minutes. The flames disappeared in less than half an hour. By 12.30, 10 to 1, 1 o'clock, somewhere in that area, the frown started to turn into smiles and we knew we had won the battle and, uh, you know, the mood was pretty, pretty good. We were, we were happy. No workers or firefighters were injured. Harnham says this was a textbook case of how things should go when fighting a fire. But that didn't stop social media from exploding with pictures of the flames. You know, the pictures were dramatic. Uh, but the knockdown and, and the control of the situation was almost as quick. The mill looks back to normal now, but what it's like inside isn't clear. The company that owns the mill, Kruger, won't say whether last night hurt production or workflow. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, Kruger got back to us late this afternoon with some extra details. The company says a fan caught fire in the roof. All of the operations were back to normal by 2 a.m. and the fire has not affected production. Well, there seems to be movement on the plan to replace Her Majesty's Penitentiary. The province is looking to see who's interested in designing, building, financing and maintaining the new correction, correctional facility. The existing building opened more than 160 years ago. The new jail is expected to have twice the capacity and better technology to improve safety, recreation and mental health services. According to a government release sent late today, some technical contracts for the replacement were awarded in March. The province says factoring maintenance and financing in with the design and construction budget will save about 12% over a 30-year contract. Last year, government pledged $200 million for the new facility. The province plans to issue a request for proposals next year, start construction in 2022 and finish by 2025. The RNC is investigating a theft of firearms from a vehicle parked at the Holiday Inn on Portugal Cove Road in St. John's. Yesterday, the owner noticed that four firearms were missing from the vehicle. That's two Sig Sars, a Glock, and a Luger. In addition, 300 rounds of 9mm ammunition and 15 empty firearm magazines were taken from the vehicle. 
Well, demonstrations are continuing in St. Albans over the closure of the local emergency department. The ER has been shut down 11 out of the last 14 weeks. The mayor says they expect good news soon, but some residents are much more skeptical. Here and now's Gary Berry reports. Another week. We won't accept it. Another protest. And we've been demonstrating here again. Uh, and we'll keep doing this every week until we get what we want. Save a three week respite with one doctor. This ER has been empty since April. We need help here. Locals have lots to say. Look at the place. It's a beautiful place. Anyone who's given enough incentive to come here will come here. And that is the problem. They won't give it to them. They're working on it, but I mean, like, this has been ongoing now for six months. And um, there's just no. Like, no affirmative uh, answer. We don't need to hear another two weeks or another month down the road. We need services today. You know, people will surely die without it. Today, an emergency means a 100-kilometer car ride, at least. My husband, you know, was in the hospital last week for cardiac issues. Um, I, I, I know full well that, uh, you know, anyone with a heart attack... Um, they're not going to make it to Harbor Breton or to Grand Falls. But the mayor says they're on the verge of a breakthrough. We're very close to having that plan uh, pushed forward. There are a couple of things that they want to make sure that are checked before we present it to the minister. And the Minister of Health is very aware of the situation and we're very encouraged that uh, he will be supportive of it. Recruiting the doctors is only one part of the issue. The other is keeping them here. The mayor here in St. Albans says there's already been doctors come and go. She wants to make sure this time it's different. That's our biggest fear is that, you know, we get all of this in place and our doctors uh, basically leave again. We cannot let that happen this time around. How do you make that happen? To start, learn from your failures. I did speak with him a few times and, you know, we have a very busy center and I'm not able to say exactly what happened, uh, but if we were to, you know, surmise on a few things, I, I think what we are doing now with the plan of the two doctors and the emergency services return, th that's what we learned from it. Others are hoping for a grand seduction. And ideally what we want is a doc young doctor uh, with a family of kids to come down here and, and uh, set up residence and spend their lives here. That's a family doctor. Garrett Berry, CBC News, St. Albans. Well, in a statement this afternoon, Central Health says it is trying to find a short-term solution. It says it's been talking to local officials and will announce details when it has something to put in place. <music> There are no new cases of COVID-19 in the province today and no active cases anymore either. It's now been one week since any new cases of the virus. The most recent case was announced last Friday and was related to travel after a man returned home from working in the United States. That man has now recovered. Well, a local television company says it wouldn't be able to resume production without using private COVID-19 testing of its staff. The private lab that's testing workers on set pays a public health facility to process the test results. Here now's Mark Quinn has more. Like a lot of us, the cast and crew of Hudson and Rex have been spending more time in Newfoundland's great outdoors and avoiding crowded places. We won't be shooting on George Street. Past seasons of the show are now airing in many countries and in many languages. But Pope says there'd be no new episodes at all without COVID-19 testing. In the same way that we could not shoot if PPE was not available, we could not shoot if the infection rate was high, we could not shoot without testing. This show is one of many businesses that have been relaunched because of testing here. Earlier this week, the owner of this lab said he has clients in the oil and gas industry and the fishing industry too. Almost everyone that's involved in the economy in some way, shape or form. It's been controversial because right now Avalon Laboratories is paying an Eastern Health Lab to analyze samples while it waits for certification to do the work itself. 
Antel says it's a temporary arrangement that he pitched to the provincial health department. We are not going to be fully up and ready to go for at least a couple of months. So in the interim, uh, would you provide us with a fee-for-service uh, uh, option so that we can uh, service our private sector employers and get those people back to work and start protecting the economy? Uh, wholeheartedly, they said yes. The provincial conservatives have raised concerns about using a public facility to do testing for private companies for a fee. But Pope says he's been assured that no one in the public will be denied testing. And he says if the virus becomes so prevalent that the need for testing becomes great, his show will no longer be in production. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, protesters in Blanc Sablon aren't backing down, and neither is the province. This is the second day residents from the small Quebec town have blocked the ferry that connects Newfoundland and Labrador. Protesters are delaying passengers because they want to be allowed to come to the island without having to isolate. Right now, they're fine to go to Labrador, but to go to Newfoundland, they have to apply for special permission like everyone else outside the Atlantic bubble. When asked if that was going to change, the Premier's office reiterated the existing rules. We're going to block. We arrived here around 5 a.m. this morning. That was 5 a.m. Quebec time. We decided that uh, we were going to be delaying the boarding of the ferry. So we delayed it for approximately two hours. We don't want to stop travel because we, I think that would do more harm than good. If, there, if there's anybody that has a medical appointment or if they need to catch a flight or something like that, well, obviously, we're not going to delay them so they miss those things. But we want to delay just to get attention to show that, A, we're here too. And so far, that's what we've been doing. Uh, we've been cooperating. We're not with a peaceful uh, protest. People are becoming more aware of our situation and our location because they think, oh, you're from Quebec. Quebec means Montreal. But it's not that at all. We're, we're contained to 60 kilometers of road in Quebec. We have no connection to Quebec unless we decide to travel by plane or unless we drive through Labrador to go to Quebec. Meanwhile, it's okay for Labrador West and New Brunswick residents to travel through Quebec. If they're doing the drive, they're encouraged to do it in less than 24 hours and to make as few stops as possible. New Brunswick, which is part of the Atlantic bubble, is also now strongly considering twinning with two regional counties in Quebec. New Brunswick says the twinning is with two counties bordering the province. Premier Blaine Higgs says they're exploring ways to reunite these communities while still keeping New Brunswick residents safe. Twinning would allow residents in these regions to travel back and forth without having to self-isolate, similar to what's happening with Fermont and Western Labrador. New Brunswick's all-party COVID-19 cabinet committee has this on their agenda next week. There's no secret that COVID-19 has certainly affected the aviation industry, to say the least, and here in Newfoundland, Labrador, it's no exception. Joining me now is Peter Avery. He is the CEO of the St. John's International Airport Authority. So, Peter, obviously some difficult news, some job losses. Uh, can you give us the details? Yes, Anthony, some unfortunate news. Uh, obviously, whenever we have to do a workforce reduction, it's the first time in our history we've actually done one. And uh, recently, on just this past Monday, we announced a 15% reduction in our workforce. All right, can you give me the breakdown on how many union jobs, how many management jobs, what are we looking at? Correct. It goes right across our whole, all sectors of our company, basically, and it uh, includes both management and uh, bargaining unit positions and also some vacant positions that we're not refilling. All right. Can you give me any numbers? Sure. It's uh, eight full-time bargaining unit positions. We have uh, also four seasonal positions uh, that won't be, uh, that are affected by this and also three, uh, vacant positions and also two management positions. Now, why have you had to make this uh, decision, Peter? Obviously not an easy one, but people's livelihoods are obviously going to be gone. Absolutely. Very difficult for all of us, for all of our team. Um, it's essential really for the ongoing viability of our airport. We've basically done everything we can. 90% of our operating costs are, uh, non-discretionary. And uh, we've made every um, effort that we can to increase efficiencies and cut costs. And right now, without any, um, any support from any level of government coming, uh, it's just we've held out as long as we can, basically. What has the impact been on, on this industry and on the airport authority? I guess catastrophic is, is the, uh, 
the best word to use. I, I just looked at our statistics and our historical traffic, and now with six months so far this year, we'd actually have to go back into the 1980s to see traffic uh, numbers as low as, as we have right now. A lot of attention on the so-called Atlantic bubble, really more of a dome across the Atlantic provinces. Isn't that giving any kind of uptick that would help uh, alleviate some of the layoffs? Certainly some, but not nearly as much as we'd like. Uh, the Atlantic region is, is only a fraction of our total travel during the summer. Obviously, the vast majority of our travel during the summer comes from the rest of Canada, from central Canada, and that's really what we uh, think is necessary as the next step. Give me a sense of what the experts say is going to be the future, the next year, two, four years down the road for the aviation industry. It's very uncertain, very fluid, of course, at this moment. We see a lot of things happening south of the border and so on, which, which causes a lot of changes. Uh, we're working well with our airline partners, with all of the airports across Canada to prepare and live with COVID and to get people traveling again and to make people uh, feel comfortable traveling again. But it's certainly um, going to be several years, and we predict in our models that it'll be 2024 at least before we're back to 2019 levels. Obviously a very difficult time for the aviation industry. Uh, Peter Avery, I hope we get a chance to do an interview about some good news somewhere down the road. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Anthony. Well, the RCMP is warning the public of a new scam targeting essential workers. Officers in Rocky Harbor say over the past few days, people have been receiving envelopes in the mail addressed to essential workers. Inside, the recipient finds what appears to be a prepaid $100 visa card in appreciation during the pandemic. A letter inside gives instructions for activating the card and asks the recipient to release the last four digits of their social insurance number over the phone or online. The RCMP says that is a scam and urges the public to never give out their social insurance number in this manner. The provincial opposition says the federal government's restart funding for Newfoundland and Labrador falls short. Yesterday, the federal government announced $19 billion for provinces and territories. That's to help them cover some of their budgets for the next few months as they reopen and prepare for a possible second wave of COVID-19. The funding goes towards testing and contact tracing, personal protective equipment, and money for childcare spaces. It's all also match funding by provinces and cities which put money into mass transportation systems. The funding is tied to conditions agreed to by the provinces, not on a per capita basis. Provincial opposition leader Chess Crosby says because of that, this province is losing out. Well, I think the problem, we, we are in a desperate level of need. Our economy has probably been hurt harder than any other economy of any province in the country. That's where our need comes from right there. Mass transit is not the issue. The issue is the federal government is not paying appropriate attention to the rough shape that we're in and designing programs that address our needs. Now we're free. Free as the birds. <laughs> Retirement home residents from Whitless Bay are hitting the town. We're cutting loose with them after the break.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Time for a look at the weather forecast, starting with the highs today and the hot spot in the province today, definitely along the northeast coast of Labrador. 29 degrees in Makovic there today. Labrador City saw quite a drop in temperature, 17 degrees there and uh, some lovely temperatures on the island, except for the Avalon Peninsula. St. John saw another 11 degree day, but uh, don't fear, uh, that is going to be changing. Uh, we do have a risk of frost overnight tonight for much of the island. Temperatures in the east will start to rebound. We're going to start seeing it come back up into the 20s. And uh, Labrador East looking at some rain moving through and staying there for a bit. So here are the areas that are at risk of frost tonight, really from Deer Lake right over to the Bonavista Peninsula. So if you're in those areas, you'll want to cover up your plants tonight or bring in your plants. Uh, just in case. All right, looking at uh, what's happening tonight, clear skies mostly across the island, but uh, the east is still looking at this uh, cloud cover, so we could have a drizzly night in St. John's nice and clear for the rest of the island and we have those showers moving through lab west so the overnight low in st john's nine nine degrees with a northeasterly wind 20 gusting to 40 so it's going to stay fairly breezy and clear skies right across the board for the rest of the island and in labrador that cloud cover moving in about two to four millimeters of rain expected for lab city uh tonight and some uh clouding over for the main area as well. Okay, so we're moving into Saturday now. You can see Lab West is in for a wet one and uh, cloud cover moving across the island as well. St. John's not too bad tomorrow. We're looking at 16 degrees as the high that's along the coast, but if you're inland, it'll be more like 20 degrees. We could see a little shower, but mostly it's gonna be a mix of sun and cloud tomorrow. So a nice day to get out in the garden and not feel overheated. Uh, for Clarenville, looking at 21 degrees as the high tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud and some heavier uh, cloud cover for the Marystown area tomorrow. For Central, Twillingate looking at 15 degrees with lots of sunshine tomorrow. But at, again, as you move inland, those temperatures will start to warm up. For the West Coast, looking at some afternoon showers. Uh, it'll start off not too bad, but uh, as the day persists, then some of those showers will move through. But temperatures still nice and warm. Along the Straits, 27 degrees in Mary's Harbor tomorrow mix of sun and cloud looking like a great day shaping up there tomorrow very light winds as well along the coast temperatures staying high uh, but more cloud cover moving through and here we have that rain for lab west uh, five millimeters expected there tomorrow but temperatures staying above 20. so looking ahead to sunday some showers on the west coast of the island and along the south coast could even maybe see some showers on the avalon peninsula the southeastern portion of Labrador and Lab West also looking at some showers there, but temperatures finally <laughs> getting into the 20s for St. John's, 23 degrees on Sunday. So looking like a fairly nice day shaping up there. Chance of showers for the rest of the island, really 24 degrees in Corner Brook for Labrador. That chance of showers for the southeast coast, 21 degrees there for Cartwright and uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay though, looking at 28 degrees there on Sunday. So as we begin the work week, things stay fairly wet for Labrador. More showers moving across for the island. Uh, 25 degrees in St. John, so we're really starting to get back into that mid-20s range. For the rest of the island, temperatures very similar. Port of a little bit cooler there along the coast, 17 degrees on Monday, and showers really across the board uh, for everyone on Monday. So you can see next week things are looking much better than they were looking this week with temperatures in the mid 20s. Chance of showers there on Tuesday and some clearing happening on Wednesday for Central looking at uh, high temperatures as well. Uh, chance of showers but then also clearing on Wednesday and similar story for the west coast of the island 24 degrees 
uh, expected on Wednesday with a mix of sun and cloud. Into Labrador, some really wet weather persisting throughout the week. Temperatures staying above 20. Uh, similar story for eastern Labrador. Wednesday looking like it could be quite the lovely day. 28 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. So here's a look at our weather uh, viewer photo of the day. This is Stiles Cove Path. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous view of the ocean. Thank you so much for sending in that lovely picture. I love seeing the lupins. <laughs> Just great. Thank you. Well, the fun-loving senior citizens from Alderwood Estates in Whitless Bay were up to their shenanigans again today. 25 of them went straight to George Street, but this isn't the first time we've heard from this particular gang. Last week, they were on the show Raising Their Roots. They wrote a song about wanting to get their hair cut. It's been months because of the rules around uh, COVID-19. The province trimmed back the restrictions shortly after their performance, though. And then uh, on Halloween, they did this, turned the retirement home into a haunted house. They called it from Club Med to Club Dead. Some of the residents actually got into coffins to scare the children that were touring around. So that's some of their past antics. Today, they left their facility to hit up downtown and they let Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton in on their fun. COVID-19 has had a massive impact on everybody's life, but one of the groups that has been hardest hit are senior citizens. Now this group here behind me are from Alderwood Estates in Whitless Bay, and after four months of being cooped up inside, they decided that they had had enough. So they hired a bus, they picked some theme music, and they traveled all the way to George Street in St. John's. They came to O'Reilly's where they're enjoying good music, good food, good friends, and some good drinks. Our theme music for today was the song Footloose uh, because, you know, they, they felt this gang is a little bit of rebel rousers, you know. The minute that the okay was given for them to break out, they wanted to break out and they've done it in high style. They were dancing, getting on the bus. They were so excited to be free and they're here having drinks and music and appies and living the life. When COVID happened and the lockdown happened, it's been so difficult on them. They have literally been under lockdown now for four months. So they were itching to get out and we couldn't think of a better place to go than O'Reilly's. Just to be free, right? I mean, we were barred up for four months. We're not allowed to see no one, we're not allowed out. But it's frustrating. Now we're free. Free as the birds. <laughs> the seniors have really, really, you know, had a heavy load during this crisis. You know, they have been in lockdown. Some of them haven't been able to see their families for months. They were going stir crazy. They're starting to climb the walls and they don't understand why. They've done nothing wrong. They want out. And so thankfully, we got permission today to take them out because locking them up. That's not a strategy, that, that's not sustainable. They need to be, we need to have ways that we can do these outings that are safe. And thankfully, Brenda O'Reilly, when we reached out, she had no qualms to shut the bar down. Whatever you need, Renee, bring them in. We will make sure that there is no contact, they will be safe. And uh, so that's why we're, we're here today. There's not enough senior care, not enough activities for seniors in the, in the, in the province. And I know only because my mom, you know, was in long-term care and she suffered from dementia in the last few years of her life. And it doesn't matter if they have dementia or if they're in a long-term care for other reasons, uh, getting out is everything. I mean, being a part of the, being able to do your normal activities and be able to do things you enjoy and, and getting some air and, and enjoying a social environment, I think that's everything. It's the first time we've had an outing since, I'd say, the last of February, middle of February. And how does it feel to be out having a bit of fun with your friends here? Oh, it's terrific. It's terrific. You're out of this, this cluster, you're in, you know, and, and it's wonderful. Majority are in their 90s, to be quite honest with you. Our oldest here today uh, is at 97, Mana Dodge, right? Yeah, so these most of them are in their 90s. Yeah. 
you can still have a quality of life amongst COVID. You can be safe and have a quality of life. It's not one or the other, it can't be. It's a lot more work, but it is workable. Welcome back to Here and Now. Pien Panashawe, an Innu elder of Sheshashi, passed away recently, and we wanted to honor him by airing a piece of a documentary centered on his passion for building canoes. This documentary was produced by the CBC's Marie Wadden in the early 2000s. You'll hear the voice of Elizabeth Panashawe narrating this excerpt of Pien's dream. Pien is making the canoe the way he was taught. And when the 
Nang kwanai chi chen nong mat nong wai chen tama na. This has a been hard for him. Pien can't see with one eye. Still, the canoe lines looks as straight as arrows. But how did he do it? He did not use a measuring tape. He measured as we did in the past. Inu hunters didn't carry much. Why take tools when your body can be used? It is getting colder. It's now time to finish the job. Canvas has been used for many years by the Eno. Pian is getting the compass ready for painting. There is time for more dreaming. Pian can see himself once more in canoe. He sees the places he travel on the water. He sees the great beauty of our homeland, the Sinan. There are places only a canoe can take you. These are the places he wants his the children and grandchildren to visit and not forget. Pien forces over last details. He has made something to be proud of. <laughs> the people from Shehajit really like it. Mm. 
Pien's dream of the making a canoe one last time has come true. Wow, a true master of his craft. Pien Panashaway's canoe is on display at the Rooms Museum in St. John's. Panashaway died recently at the age of 93. Welcome back. The real life version of Theodore Tugboat is now up for sale. Theodore II was named after the boat in the CBC Children's TV show and became a tourist attraction. And as Colleen Jones tells us, it could be yours for half a million dollars.
Commodore arrived in Halifax Harbor in 2000, a real-life replica of this tiny, remote-controlled Theodore, the star of the children's TV series Theodore Tugboat. Theodore this was the set for the Gemini Award-winning kids show that looked exactly like Halifax but was set in Big Harbor. The show ran on CBC from 1993 to 2001. The fact that a real-life replica of Theodore was built speaks to the tug's popularity. Now, for $495,000, he could be yours. We had been thinking about selling Theodore pre-COVID. Dennis Campbell owns Ambassadors, the COVID reality with no cruise ships or visitors outside the Atlantic bubble. Theodore can't earn his keep. He carries 49 passengers, but in COVID times, he can only carry a fraction of that. You know, the result of COVID made the decision for us. Uh, it's a different time. It's a, it's a challenging time for the tourism industry. Scruton Marine in Ontario has the Theo listing. They say it's the most unique boat they've ever tried to sell. How many boats come with a hat after all? It's early days, but thousands have already looked at the listing. I'm so impressed to see how he's blown up on social media. Um, I've had calls, I can't keep up with the calls across the country in the last 24 hours um, about, you know, they, they say you can't sell Theodore and, and it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's sad. I just remember Theodore Tugboat when I was a little kid. Two GoFundMe pages are running to save Theodore. Anastasia Cook started We Buy Theodore Tugboat. She only has $740 so far of the $495,000 needed. It's a big price tag, but I think Theodore Tugboat's worth it, personally. Um, but You're not giving up yet? No, I'm not giving it up. But if you knew the show, you know Theodore always overcame obstacles. Dennis Campbell hopes Theodore stays in Halifax and maybe the new owners get imaginative turning it into a floating cottage or Airbnb. Kitchen, dining room, um, there's a suite upstairs. Campbell knows how iconic Theodore is, but the bigger picture is keeping his whole business afloat in these COVID times. Colleen Jones, CBC News, Halifax. Well, back here at home, our coast is certainly no stranger to fog. Forty years ago, scientists were trying to figure out more about what caused it. Researchers at Memorial University set out to study fog in this province. John McQuaker had this story. Fog along the coast of Newfoundland. It may look picturesque, but it can be dangerous. And it certainly inconveniences people. Use of St. John's Airport was severely restricted by fog for a few weeks at this time last year. We generally know the conditions when fog occurs. High humidity, low temperature, and small particles in the air for water vapor to cling to. But we don't know what the specific conditions for coastal fogs are. Dr. C.W. Cho, Head of Physics at Memorial University. Our LIDAR measurement will yield the temperature reading uh, the uh, water content in the atmosphere at the different distance from the original the uh, site and uh, also size distributions. So these are the three factors we'll be able to determine immediately instantaneously. To study fog, the researchers will use a LIDAR. That's a laser that works like radar, sending out beams of focused concentrated light that are reflected back by small particles in the air. First, lab work will create specific fog conditions in a controlled environment. Then they'll go outside to find out exactly how fog forms in the real world. In the short term, they hope to be able to develop a method for forecasting that could be used on oil rigs and by fishermen to warn of impending heavy fog. And eventually, over a period of many years, maybe even control fog or make it disperse over small areas such as around an airport. John McQuaker, CBC News. St. John's. And speaking of fog, it's been a wet, nasty day in St. John's, but it looks like things are looking up. We'll have your weather recap just ahead after the birthdays and anniversaries.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Congratulations to Bill and Doris Hudson of Pooch Cove, who are celebrating their 65th wedding anniversary. 50th wedding anniversary greetings going out to Neil and Patricia Rowe of Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 62nd anniversary to Marge and Dale Ernst. Harry and Ruth Saunders are celebrating 61 years of marriage. Congratulations to Bill and Ger Geraldine Butt of Grand Falls, Windsor, who are celebrating their 54th wedding anniversary. Happy 50th anniversary to Blanche and Max Chambers from Stephenville. Happy 54th anniversary to Clyde and Sylvia Wenzel of Portland Creek. Happy 51st anniversary to George and Doris Fudge of Francois. Happy 50th anniversary to Max and Shirley Stacy of Badger. Wishing Gladys and Tom Grandy from Grand Bank a happy 55th anniversary. Francis and Sylvia Corgan of Trapassi, now living in Bay Bulls, are celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary. 60th wedding anniversary greetings going out to Lawrence and Marina Penny of Lewisport. Wishing Peter and Dolores Wheeler from St. John's a very happy 50th anniversary. 50th wedding anniversary greetings going out to Graham and Francis Horwood of St. John's. Happy 74th wedding anniversary to George and Mary Elliott from Maine Brook. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Clarence and Anne Malloy of Portugal Cove South. Happy 60th anniversary to Virginia and Calvin Payne of St. John's. Happy 53rd wedding anniversary to Oswald and Lorraine Hodder of Stoneville. Congratulations to Linda and Mike Warford of Bay Roberts who are celebrating their 50th anniversary. Congratulations to Bob and Jean Young of Corner Brook who are celebrating their 53rd wedding anniversary. Happy 51st anniversary to Stan and Ruth Baker of Labrador City now living in Deer Lake. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Pierce and Bride Osmond of Pilly's Island. Congratulations to Bob and Gay White of Carmenville who are celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary. Happy 62nd anniversary to Ruth and Carl Gowdy of Deer Lake. Kay and Wince Parsons of St. John's are celebrating their 50th anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 54th wedding anniversary to Tom and Verna Moulton of St. John's. Happy 54th anniversary also to Murray and Hilda Burton of Long Island. Happy 55th wedding anniversary to Lynn and Whit Keen of Labrador City. Happy 56th wedding anniversary to Bill and Josephine Lane from Tilting Fogo Island, now living in Gander. Happy anniversary to Lloyd and Glenda Pike of Harbor Grace. They're celebrating their 55th wedding anniversary. Happy 98th birthday to Emily Coates of Glenwood, now living in Gander. Happy birthday to Angela Fleming of Torbay, who is celebrating her 93rd birthday. Happy 95th birthday to Vera Buck in Mount Pearl. Birthday greetings going out to Susie Gray of Lumsden, now living in Gander. She's celebrating her 92nd birthday. Happy 91st birthday to Lillian Elson from Cartwright, now living in Mary's Harbor. Happy 94th birthday to Mildred Wright in Springdale. Happy birthday to Bessie Spurl, who's celebrating her 98th birthday. She's from Pools Island and now lives in Badgers Key. Hazel Penny Seward is celebrating her 90th birthday. She's from Corner Brook and now lives in St. John's. Happy 92nd birthday to Kevin Howard of Mount Pearl. Happy 92nd birthday also to Ethel Thomason of Grand Bank. Jane Pollitt of New Harbor will be turning 101 this Wednesday. Happy birthday. Happy 90th birthday to Maud Eddy of North Harbor, now living in Clarenville. And happy birthday to Mary Sturge of St. John's, who just turned 92. Another fine crowd. Congratulations once again. Well, here's someone else who's probably celebrating. Captain Tom Moore, the 100-year-old UK veteran who inspired millions, received a knighthood from the Queen today. 
The queen conferred the honor at Windsor Castle using the sword that belonged to her father, King George VI. It was her first in-person engagement since COVID restrictions went into force in March. Sir Tom wasn't required to take a knee, but the self-deprecating Yorkshireman had earlier joked that uh, he might never get up if he was asked to kneel. The Second World War veteran completed a fundraising pledge to do 100 laps of his garden before his 100th birthday in April, but he single-handedly raised nearly 33 million pounds. That's more than 50 million Canadian dollars for UK healthcare workers during the pandemic. Well, there was another ceremony at Windsor Castle today. Princess Beatrice was married this morning to Italian property developer Eduardo Mapelli Mazzi. The pair wed in a small private ceremony with the Queen and Prince Philip among those in attendance. The wedding was originally scheduled for May, but coronavirus delayed the plans. The palace said that all government COVID-19 guidelines were followed, which means there were no more than 30 people at today's ceremony. No pictures from the wedding have been released yet. Well, before we leave you tonight, here's a quick recap of the weather forecast heading into the weekend. Warming up slightly in St. John's, 16 degrees as the high. Warmer inland, 20 degrees. Uh, for Marystown, 24 with uh, some cloud cover. Chance of showers in the west. Cornerbrook looking at a high of 23 degrees with some pretty light winds on the coast tomorrow. In Labrador, it's a hot one in uh, Cartwright tomorrow. 25 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. And Lab City is seeing some rain tomorrow with uh, 22 degrees as the high. Well, that's it for this edition of Here and Now. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend.